The humid air was alive with the smell of the sea as evening fell on Gulf Breeze, Florida. It was November 11th, 1987, an otherwise typical night in this sleepy beach town. But for Ed Walters, a successful building contractor, it was the start of a strange journey that would captivate UFO enthusiasts worldwide. It's a story teetering on the razor's edge of belief and skepticism. A tale that's garnered a cult following for its uncanny blend of the ordinary and the otherworldly. This is the story of the Gulf Breeze UFO incident. Ed Walters was in his home office when the strangeness began. He saw a curious pulsating light outside the window. He initially dismissed it as a reflection, but the unflagging persistence of the light caught his attention. Stepping outside with his Polaroid camera, he bore witness to a sight that defied explanation. A glowing, disc-shaped object hovering silently above the highway. As he quickly captured images of the apparition, a paralyzing blue beam allegedly shot from the object, knocking him out cold. When Ed regained consciousness, the craft was gone, but the photos remained. Upon developing the images, he found himself staring at a physical representation of an inexplicable experience. It was a metallic object, looking almost too stereotypical to be real, with its round, saucer-like shape, a dome on top, and pulsating blue and red lights. It was a surreal sight to behold, an apparent intrusion from another world. These encounters became a strange routine for Ed Walters. Over the next several months, he claimed to have sighted the UFO nearly 20 more times. In one incident, an encounter with the unidentified flying object took an even stranger turn. When he reported seeing the craft land on Soundside Drive, a tranquil stretch of road in Gulf Breeze, this event marked a new chapter in Ed's narrative, deepening the mystery that surrounded him. According to Ed, the craft didn't merely touch down, it made an extraordinary deposit. Five beings of otherworldly origin. His description of these aliens were equally perplexing. Unlike the grotesque pop culture images of extraterrestrials, these creatures had humanoid appearance, though there was something uncannily different about them. Ed reported a chilling interaction during this encounter. One of the beings purportedly fixed its gaze into his window, a stare that bridged the distance between them. At this point, the alien, in a baffling display of cognitive abilities, communicated with Ed, not through the conventional means of language, but via telepathy. The message transcended human dialects. It was in English and Spanish, as though the sender had an understanding of human languages. The telepathic communication took an even more bizarre turn when the being presented Ed with a book containing pictures of dogs. The encounter reached its climax when a blue beam of light allegedly enveloped Ed. He described it as a force that counteracted gravity, lifting him approximately three feet off the ground. The sensation wasn't painful, but profoundly disorienting, as though the laws of physics had been momentarily suspended. This report of direct contact marked a dramatic escalation in Ed's encounters. Not only did it deepen the sense of mystery, but it also opened up a myriad of new questions. How did these beings communicate telepathically? What was the significance of the dog imagery? Most importantly, what were these beings' intentions? The truth, as ever, remained elusive, but these encounters added further layers to the enigmatic tale. The curious thing is, Ed always seemed to get Polaroids as proof. The photos, however, were met with a mix of fascination and skepticism. While UFO enthusiasts hailed them as credible evidence of extraterrestrial visitation, skeptics raised questions about their authenticity. In late 1987, Ed shared his photos and experiences with the local newspaper, the Gulf Breeze Sentinel, sparking a UFO frenzy. My first reaction was, Polaroid? It's got to be real. I mean, how do you fake a Polaroid? <laughs> and that's what had me convinced to go ahead and 
put it in the paper right away. The tale quickly caught national attention, and the small beach town found itself under the microscope of the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, one of the oldest and largest civilian UFO investigative organizations in the United States. Been watching, and we know that he hadn't got the time to do this, to set this thing up. He's a businessman. He's a... He's got work to do. As MUFON descended on Gulf Breeze, the town became a hotbed for UFO sightings, with locals and visitors alike reporting encounters. These weren't merely isolated incidents, but rather a community-wide experience that left an indelible mark on Gulf Breeze's residents. Sightings varied in their specifics, yet striking commonalities linked these accounts. The descriptions frequently included an oval or oblong craft, a radiant orange glow, and vibrant beams of light, either orange or blue. One woman even reported a close encounter at her residence, recounting a 2 a.m. awakening to find an orange-lit UFO hovering in her yard. In July 1988, Fenner McConnell and his wife Shirley offered an account that was hard to dismiss. They claimed to witness a disc-shaped airplane without wings skimming over the water surface, its landing lights illuminating their pier. Shirley would later identify this enigmatic entity in Walter's photographs published in the Sentinel. One of the most notable sightings came from Brenda Pollock, a Gulf Breeze councilwoman and known associate of Walters. On March 17, 1988, while driving across the Pensacola Bay Bridge, she observed an orange light skimming the treetops. Returning home to share this uncanny experience with her husband, Buddy, she discovered him engaging in examining Walter's photos with a group at Shoreline Park. When the group departed for a brief hot chocolate break, leaving Walters alone, they returned to the scene of unexpected flashes of light. Walters had managed to cap more Polaroids of the alleged UFO. Brenda's faith in Walters' sincerity lent further credibility to his claims. Similarly, Santa Rosa County Commissioner John Broxson narrated an encounter where he, along with several friends, witnessed a parade of bright multicolored lights hovering above his residence. In early November 1987, Art and Mary Hufford reported seeing something gray, oval, and silent flying above the treetops. Staying within their sight for several minutes, the object matched the one in Walter's photographs, further corroborating his account. Jeff Thompson and his 12-year-old son also claimed a sighting on February 8, 1989. They observed a three-foot-wide and two-foot-high craft for about 10 minutes, during which Jeff attempted to approach the craft. When he came within 30 feet, the craft emitted a white light, crackled, and seemingly disappeared into thin air. Jerry Thompson, a toll booth operator unrelated to Jeff Thompson, reported a mass sighting where he and a group observed 13 pink-lighted objects blinking in a seemingly coordinated pattern. Residents even reported an incident where eight helicopters were purportedly chasing a UFO on January 8, 1990, a claim vehemently denied by the United States Navy. These accounts, arriving from a range of sources, ordinary citizens, town dignitaries, and even skeptical individuals, painted a vivid picture of Gulf Breeze as a hotspot for UFO activity, propelling its reputation as a focal point of paranormal curiosity. Further to this, Ed Walters alleged more encounters with the inexplicable, extending beyond the boundary of photographic evidence. He reported experiences of missing time, a phenomenon often associated with UFO encounters on three distinct occasions. Each incident, according to Walters, was marked by a peculiar gap in his memory, an unaccountable lapse of time that couldn't be explained by normal means. The first episode occurred during a seemingly tranquil canoe trip. Walters claimed that during this excursion, a portion of time simply vanished from his conscious experience, as though he had momentarily slipped out of the temporal continuum. The second instance took place during an episode that, on the surface, resembled a conventional nightmare. However, upon waking up, Walters discovered a discontinuity in his perception of time, lending the episode an eerie aura that transcended the bounds of a mere dream. The third, and perhaps the most disconcerting experience, transpired while Walters was driving at night. Amidst the monotony of the dark, Walters suddenly found himself enveloped in an unnerving void. The comforting glow of the car and streetlights had inexplicably disappeared, leaving him adrift in an opaque sea of darkness. 
In the midst of this eerie isolation, Walters recounted stepping out of his car and witnessing a brilliant light advancing towards him. This radiance, according to his account, lifted off the road as he re-entered his vehicle, casting an otherworldly glow that bathed the interior of his car. The climax of this strange encounter was the sudden shift in time. Walters reported finding himself amidst the bustle of morning traffic, a staggering five hours later than his last coherent memory. These claims of missing time, while they could not be empirically verified, added a new dimension of intrigue to the enigmatic tale of the Gulf Breeze UFO incident. The MUFON investigation brought a measure of legitimacy to Ed's claims. A rigorous analysis of his Polaroids failed to find any evidence of tampering or hoaxing. However, the mystery thickened when Ed underwent regressive hypnosis to recover lost memories. He recounted being abducted by extraterrestrials, revealing intricate details about the alien's craft's interior and its occupants. While such claims often provoke skepticism, the consistency in Ed's accounts added another layer to the enigma. In an attempt to quell the rising skepticism and validate his accounts, Ed Walters underwent a polygraph test in February of 1988. Polygraphs, also known as lie detector tests, measure physiological responses such as blood pressure, pulse, respiration, and skin conductivity, while the subject answers a series of questions. Any noticeable changes in these parameters could suggest that the individual is being deceitful. The examiner, a seasoned professional with years of experience discerning truth from falsehood, concluded that Walters believes his photos are real. It was a statement that only deepened the mystery. It didn't unequivocally authenticate the photos, but instead suggested that if this was a hoax, Walters himself was blissfully unaware of it. His firm belief in the reality of his experiences was evidently unshakable. In addition to the polygraph test, Walters also caught the attention of prominent UFO researcher Bud Hopkins. Hopkins, known for his methodical and in-depth exploration of alleged UFO encounters, conducted several interviews with Walters. He emerged from these interactions convinced of Walters' sincerity. Hopkins underscored a couple of pivotal factors that led him to believe Walters' accounts. Firstly, Walters had declined a lucrative $100,000 book deal. This refusal of a substantial monetary benefit seemed to contradict the theory that Walters was perpetrating a hoax for financial gain. Secondly, Walters' successful passage of a polygraph test significantly bolstered his credibility. I feel that there's absolutely no sign of a hoax, that the photographs are genuine, that the witnesses are telling the truth, and that this presents probably the best, uh, without any doubt, the best photographic evidence in, in 40 years of UFO investigation. Bruce McAbee, an esteemed optical physicist affiliated with the Navy in Washington, D.C., also took a look at the Polaroid images. Examining Walter's photographs, McAbee didn't hastily dismiss them as mere fabrications, as some skeptics might. Instead, he lent a surprising degree of credibility to Walter's claims. He stated, I think there is a good chance it's the real thing. Because the first one shows the, the tree blocking part of this object. And you can't do that in a single, simple double exposure. You could do it with a so-called masked double exposure, where you make a mask that blocks out the background light. But you, it'd be impossible to do that with this, one of these handheld cameras. You have to get very accurate registration between, say, the edge of the tree and where the edge of the object is being blocked by the tree. This sentiment from such a reputable figure stirred further intrigue in the unfolding drama. If a seasoned scientist practiced in the art of discernment and rigorous investigation believed there was a substantial chance that the images were authentic, it encouraged a fresh wave of speculation and intense debate. Yet the tale of the Gulf Breeze incident doesn't conclude with a simple believe-it-or-not dichotomy. On June 10, 1990, a controversial revelation came to light in the Pensacola News Journal. Craig Myers, a seasoned journalist, disclosed the finding of a model at Ed Walters' previous residence in Gulf Breeze. The model bore a striking resemblance to the UFO depicted in Walters' photographs. Comprised of four foam plates and some drafting paper, its discovery ignited a new wave of skepticism. However, in response to this discovery, Walters declined to undergo another polygraph test. 
Instead, he opted to sign a formal declaration stating he had no prior knowledge of the model. This statement was echoed by the homeowner who discovered the object, who also formally attested to having no information about its creator. A subsequent experiment by news journal photographers using the model managed to recreate images strikingly similar to those presented in Walter's book. Further stirring the cauldron of controversy, the contentious model measured 9 inches in diameter and 5 inches in depth. Its composition included a blue plastic film, an orange paper ring 6 inches in diameter, a plastic tube around 3.5 inches long, and a 2-inch wide paper ring held together with electrical tape. Intriguingly, carefully drafted windows were punched out on the drafting paper, encircling two-thirds of the model. On the reverse side of this paper, the dimensions for a house on Jamestown Drive were scribbled in what appeared to be Walter's handwriting. According to Santa Rosa County building permits, Walters had built at least two homes on Jamestown Drive. The model was unearthed from beneath the attic insulation after Walters and his family had vacated the premises in 1988. Its discovery was only reported when the new homeowner was questioned by a journalist on the topic of UFOs. Walters strongly denied having any knowledge of the model, instead suggesting it could have been planted by UFO debunkers or the U.S. government. Hundreds of people in Gulf Breeze are testifying to seeing this thing. Now, if you want to believe I'm a faker or a trickster, then you also have to somehow or another convince all these other people who are saying they see the same thing that they are also hosters and tricksters. He later alleged to the News Journal that a mysterious stranger had been spotted entering his garage, descending the attic stairs, and hastily departing. The stranger's vehicle, according to a former neighbor, bore out-of-state license plates. However, the Gulf Breeze police reported no break-ins at Walter's house. The discovery of the model polarized the UFO community, with some echoing Walter's claims that the model had been planted. Boyd, a former director of MUFON, recounted that he was pressured to leave the group when he voiced doubts about Walter's photos. According to a column by Mark Curtis of the News Journal, two MUFON investigators who confirmed the hoax were virtually driven out of the organization by steadfast, true believers. The mysteries of the Gulf Breeze UFO incident had now deepened into a saga of intrigue and contention. Like many UFO tales, the Gulf Breeze incident leaves us with more questions than answers. Was Ed Walters a genuine contactee? providing us with some of the most compelling evidence of extraterrestrial visitation? Or was he a cunning hoaxer, orchestrating one of the most elaborate UFO scams of the 20th century? To this day, the Gulf Breeze UFO incident stands as one of the most enduring UFO mysteries.